This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're starting off September with a new series called Bad Teacher. As we enter into the new school year, I'm reminded of all the great teachers I've had over the years. I would imagine that many of you as well may have been fortunate enough to have had a special teacher or teachers who encouraged you, inspired you, and perhaps even challenged you with the gift of learning. Educators are some of the most hardworking and dedicated people we encounter in our lives, and might I say, some of the very best people I know are teachers. But the stories I'm going to share with you this month are not about those good teachers, no I'll be sharing cases of teachers who, for various reasons, went bad and committed crimes from fraud to sexual misconduct and even murder. On this week's episode, I'll tell you about a grade school teacher who was well-respected by her peers and loved by her students. But an inappropriate infatuation with a very young student would lead her to make decisions that would scandalize not only her community, but the entire nation. This is Chapter 1 of Bad Teacher. The Case of Mary Kay Letourneau. It was a warm summer evening on June 18, 1996, when a Des Moines, Washington police officer was patrolling the area near the marina. Des Moines, a town with a population of less than 30,000, is located on the east shore of Puget Sound, about halfway between two of Washington state's largest cities, Seattle, and Tacoma. It is normally a quiet town, even during the summer months, and on a Tuesday night like this one, there was little to concern the patrol officer on his normal patrol route. As he passed by the marina parking lot, the officer noticed a vehicle that seemed out of place. It was one of the only cars on the lot, and he could make out some movement from inside the vehicle. He decided to check it out, thinking it might be some teenagers kicking off their school summer break by finding a secluded parking lot to drink or smoke weed. As he parked his patrol car and began walking up to the vehicle, he saw a figure jump from the back seat of the car to the driver's seat. He tapped on the window and shined his flashlight inside. A youngish-looking woman with blonde hair looked up and rolled down her window. She looked flushed and appeared to be nervous. As he began asking her to exit her vehicle, he saw some movement from the back seat. Training his flashlight beam that way, he saw the figure of a young male lying across the back seat as if sleeping. The woman was polite and answered the officer's questions without hesitation, but as she stepped out of the car, he observed she was wearing only a t-shirt that covered her up to her thighs. Oh, the officer thought, just a couple getting a bit too amorous in a car. Well, he'd just ask for their IDs, make sure things checked out, and then send them on their way with a warning. The woman was petite and older than she had appeared at first glance. But when the male emerged from the vehicle, the officer saw that he was just a boy who couldn't have been older than 13 or 14. The woman told the officer that the boy was a family friend who was a house guest staying with her and her husband that summer. That evening, she explained, she and her spouse had gotten into an argument. Their guest had overheard, become upset, and left on foot. She'd gotten into her car to track him down and found him walking near the marina. She'd been able to persuade him to get into the car, she said, but he hadn't wanted to return to the house. So she'd let him lie down in the back seat where he'd fallen asleep. She was just about to drive him back home when the officer had arrived. The officer thought the story didn't make much sense. He became even more suspicious when she said that the boy was 18 years old he decided to take them into the station to try and figure out what was really going on. When first questioned in the parking lot, the woman had given the officer two names that now he determined were fake. Once at the police station, she gave their real names. She was 34-year-old Mary Kay Letourneau, and the boy was Vili Fulau. He was just about a week away from celebrating his 13th birthday. Mary Kay told them that she was a teacher at Shorewood Elementary School in Burien. Billy was her student. She said the truth was, the boy was having trouble at home, and needing someone to talk to had sought her out. 
she had agreed to meet him as he didn't want her to come to his house. The officer called the boy's mother and told her that her son had been found in the company of his teacher, Mrs. Letourneau. According to the officer, Mrs. Fulau seemed unconcerned when she learned Vili was with his teacher. The officer asked her if she wanted to pick her son up from the station, but as she could not leave her other children alone, she asked if Mrs. Letourneau could drive him home. The officer agreed as long as they had her permission. However, the officer did not inform her that his initial impression upon discovering the woman and the boy was that they might have been engaged in sex. Nor did he tell her that at first, Mary Kay had lied about Vili's age and identity. But the truth would soon be revealed. 34-year-old Mary Kay Letourneau, a married mother of four, had been having sex with her 12-year-old student for more than two months. I just decided to make a change to my bedroom. It's amazing how something like a new coat of paint can really change the whole mood of a room. This change inspired me to make others, like getting up a few minutes earlier so as not to have to rush through my morning routine. Maybe having a few minutes to really savor that cup of coffee before moving forward with my jam-packed schedule. In life, making small changes to your day can lead to positive and overall lifestyle changes. For example, the right bedding can turn a bed into a calming retreat. That's why I love my Brooklinen sheets. Brooklinen provides luxury products without the luxury price tag. When I make up my bed with Brooklinen sheets and pillowcases, climbing into bed at night feels like a really special treat. And don't we all deserve a special treat right now? Brooklinen makes it easy and affordable to pamper yourself. You can shop right online for Brooklinen bedding, loungewear, towels, and more. And Brooklinen works directly with manufacturers, cutting out the middleman to bring the savings directly to you. Brooklinen is the perfect place to start making small changes that make big differences. And Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, loungewear, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code ONCE, only at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Smokescreen Fake Priest is an investigative podcast hosted by Alex Schumann. Schumann has been chasing down the story of a con man named Ryan Scott for years. Father Ryan, as he was known, was a popular priest for three decades, but he was also a con man who spent years swindling millions of dollars from people as he traveled around the Midwest posing as a priest. Besides performing fake weddings and baptisms, Ryan Scott also committed fraud, theft, identity theft, elder abuse, and was also tied to the deaths of two priests one whose murder is still unsolved, and another who died under suspicious circumstances. Holy moly, you will not want to miss this story. And here's the kicker. With all of that, Ryan Scott is a free man today and working on yet another con. You can follow all the fascinating details of this case by subscribing to the new documentary podcast by Neon Hum Media called Smokescreen Fake Priest. You won't want to miss it. Host Alex Schumann gets an exclusive sit-down interview with Father Ryan himself, where he reveals a shocking secret. But you've got to tune in to find out. Subscribe and listen to Fake Priest now. To listen to the podcast, just search for Smokescreen Fake Priest in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Mary Kay Letourneau was born Mary Kay Schmitz on January 30, 1962. One of seven children and the only girl, Mary Kay grew up in a politically conservative and religious home. Both of her parents were active in politics. Her mother, Mary, campaigned against the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s. Among other things, the ERA, as it was called, sought to provide women with the same rights as men in matters such as divorce, property ownership, and employment rights. Conservative women organized to oppose the ratification of the amendment, arguing that it would negatively impact housewives. They feared that they would be made eligible for the draft, and caused them to lose protections such as alimony and being favored in child custody cases. Mary's father, John Schmitz, was a professor of political science and held several political positions over the years. When Mary Kay was just two years old, her father won a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, and the family moved to Washington, D.C. In 1972, Schmitz became a presidential candidate running under the right-wing American Independent Party. He lost the election, but won a respectable number of votes, one million, for a minority party candidate. 
The family returned to California when Schmitz once more was elected as a Republican state senator in 1978. He had his goal set on running for the U.S. Senate in the 1982 election. The Schmitz family projected an image of a wholesome American family. They sent their children to Catholic schools and were faithful churchgoers. John Schmitz ran his campaigns on strong family values and the principles of his religious faith. But John Schmitz was leading a double life. He had begun a long-term affair with one of his former students in 1973. In 1980, Carla Stuckel gave birth to Schmitz's son, and in 1982, she became pregnant with his daughter while his campaign for the U.S. Senate was in full swing. If having a secret family wasn't enough to derail a political campaign, it was how the affair was discovered that made it even more scandalous. Carla was reported to the authorities for suspected abuse and neglect of her two-year-old son, John George. When questioned by the investigator, Carla at first refused to identify the child's father. Threatened with losing custody of her child, Carla finally admitted that his father was John Schmitz, the state senator. Investigators contacted Schmitz. They approached him as he left a meeting of the John Birch Society. He admitted to being John George's father, but refused to take responsibility for the child, saying he, quote, did not and would not support him financially, unquote. Referring to his mistress, Schmitz said, it's her responsibility to take care of him. When the story of his affair and refusal to support his soon-to-be two children out of wedlock was exposed, John Schmitz's political career was left in tatters, as was his marriage. His wife kicked him out of the house, but as a committed Catholic who believed divorce was a sin, Mary would later take her husband back. When Mary Kay learned her father had a secret family, she was devastated. She'd always been her father's favorite, describing herself as a daddy's girl. When she was just a toddler, her father loved to take her to his Capitol Hill office to show off his pretty little daughter. She was always cheerful and talkative and liked nothing better than to be the center of attention, especially her father's attention. Mary Kay blamed her mother for her father's infidelity. She said her mother was emotionally and physically cold and didn't show her husband enough affection. Mary and her family experienced a tragic loss when she was just 11 years old. One summer afternoon, the family was hosting a pool party in their backyard. Mary and her older brother, Jerry, were playing in the shallow end of the pool when their three-year-old brother, Philip, decided to go into the deep end. Before he jumped in, he removed his life jacket. No one saw him dive in, and by the time Mary's mother asked where the little boy was, it was too late. Philip was found drowned at the bottom of the pool. Years later, Mary would decline to speak about it, saying only, it was an accident. Nobody was to blame. But Mary's friends would report that she believed her parents had always blamed her for the accident, as she'd been the one left in charge of watching over Philip that day. Mary, like her siblings, attended Catholic schools during her primary and high school years. In high school, she began rebelling, secretly at first, against her strict Catholic upbringing. She hung out with a group of kids who were considered partiers. She was also called boy crazy, always looking for male attention jumping from one boyfriend to the next. After graduation, Mary Kay was accepted as a student at Arizona State University. Away from home for the first time, Mary cut loose and was said to be a, quote, party animal, unquote. It was at Arizona State that Mary met Steve Letourneau. She thought the blonde athletic guy was cute, and they began partying together and then dating each other somewhat exclusively. Both would have a wandering eye for others, though, and Mary didn't consider the relationship serious. She wasn't looking to marry yet. The news of her father's scandal broke while she was attending Arizona State. Away from home, she did her best to distance herself from it and tried not to let it affect her good time at college. In 1985, during her last year before graduation, Mary Kay discovered she was pregnant. Raised to believe that sex outside of marriage was a sin, Mary became frantic. She called her mother and confessed that she was pregnant with Steve's baby. Her mother was strongly against abortion and told her that she would have to marry the baby's father. Mary didn't love Steve, but she felt like she had no choice. Steve, she later said, would not have been her first choice for a life mate. She felt he was too immature and didn't think he was, quote, her intellectual equal, unquote. But he was willing to marry her, so she said yes. 
They both dropped out of college and, when Stephen Jr. was born, moved to Anchorage, Alaska, Steve's hometown. He began working there as a baggage handler for Alaska Airlines. Money was tight, and Mary Kay and Steve had frequent arguments over their finances and Steve's alleged infidelity. Mary Kay also felt isolated and lonely in Alaska. After a year there, Steve agreed to a job transfer to Seattle. The year they moved there, Mary Kay gave birth to their second child, a girl named Mary Claire. Two more children were born to Steve and Mary in the next few years. Mary was bright and personable and wanted more from life than being a stay-at-home mom. She had always wanted to teach, so she began taking classes at night to complete her college degree and earn her teaching certificate. She graduated from Seattle University in 1989. She was immediately hired as a second-grade teacher for Shorewood Elementary School in Burien, a suburb of Seattle. The family moved into a home in nearby Des Moines. Mrs. Letourneau quickly became a favorite with her students. Mary Kay was energetic, friendly, and high-spirited. Thin and petite with wavy blonde curls, she appeared younger than her 27 years. She was also affectionate with her students. She created an end-of-the-day routine for her class called HHH. As each student said goodbye at the door, they could choose to give her a handshake, a high five, or a hug. School teachers and administrators applauded Mary Kay for her dedication and her love for her students. But it was also reported that she was a poor disciplinarian. Her classroom, as a result, was described as somewhat chaotic. Mary didn't like to give her students too many rules, as she'd grown up in such a strict household herself. She believed children should be free to make their own choices. One other criticism leveled at Mary Kay's teaching style was her focus on the gifted students. Mary Kay had always considered herself exceptional in her intellect and talents and singled out those students who she felt had the most potential. With these students, Mary Kay spent extra time and attention encouraging and mentoring them. She remembered what it felt like when her father had chosen her, out of all his other children, to dote upon with his time and attention. Her father, as a high achiever in the political field, felt exceptionalism should be rewarded, and Mary Kay applied this same principle to her students. There was one particular student who showed early artistic promise, and she soon took an interest in encouraging him in this skill. His name was Vili Fulau, and he first entered Mrs. Letourneau's class in second grade when he was eight years old. Billy Fulau was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, on June 26, 1983. His father, Lou, and his mother, Suna, both from the Polynesian island of Samoa, met in Hawaii. Billy's father was in and out of prison and had been married five times in total. Billy had 18 brothers and sisters, some he'd never met. By the time Billy was in grade school, his father was serving a long prison sentence for armed robbery. Suna provided for her children by working in a bakery taking on as many shifts as possible to scrape enough money together to make ends meet. The family settled in Burien, Washington in 1991, and Vili began second grade in Mrs. Letourneau's class. He was shy and didn't talk much, but his teacher noticed that he had a talent for drawing and loved art class. She encouraged him in this, hoping to draw him out of his shell. Mary Kay would later say that her friendliness was sometimes interpreted as flirtatiousness especially by some of the little boys in her class who developed schoolboy crushes on her. Vili, who was starved for attention in a large family with an absent father and a mother who was often at work, thrived in Mrs. Letourneau's class. He began showing his gratitude by leaving his teacher special drawings he'd made especially for her. In a later interview, Mary Kay said that Vili told her that all the boys in her class had a crush on her and dared each other to look up her skirt. Vili said he didn't recall saying this, but if Mary Kay said so, it must have happened. Billy continued at Sherwood Elementary, but as he moved up to the next grades, he no longer had Mary Kay as his teacher. However, she continued to greet him whenever she saw him at the school and ask him if he was keeping up with his artwork and about how things were at home. At Mary Kay's own home, things were not going so well. The couple still struggled financially with four children to raise. Steve, Mary Kay claims, cheated on her multiple times and didn't try very hard to conceal his infidelities. There were rumors that Mary Kay had also strayed occasionally. 
She also accused her husband of being not only emotionally, but physically abusive. In 1995, at the age of 33, Mary Kay suffered a miscarriage. That same year, her father was diagnosed with cancer and underwent treatment. Mary had been hit hard that year with the loss of a child and the fear of losing her father as well. She felt her husband did not support her emotionally during this time and had left her alone to deal with her grief and fear. By 1996, Mary Kay had been teaching at Sherwood Elementary for over six years. She was promoted that year to teach both fifth and sixth grades. Billy Folau entered her class for the second time. He was now in the sixth grade. Mary Kay once again took special interest in Vili, and he once again lapped up the attention. At age 12, his school chums began teasing him that he had a crush on Mrs. Letourneau. Mary Kay, although now 33 and the mother of four children, could at times act somewhat immaturely. She liked joking around with her students, and she and Vili even had some inside jokes they shared with one another. All this interaction with the Fulau boy did not go unnoticed by the other students and even some of the faculty members. They would later report that Mary Kay and Vili appeared to be, quote, always flirting with one another, unquote. As the school year ended, Mary Kay began inviting Vili and his brothers to her home. She told her husband she was mentoring the budding artist. Mary was involved with the school district summer school art camp that she encouraged Vili to attend. She spent time with him at the program and after it ended, invited him to attend art classes at the nearby community college. She drove Vili to the college for the summer program classes, which she also attended. Her husband was starting to lose patience with the amount of time Mary Kay was spending with this one particular student. Vili was a nice kid, Steve thought, and Mary Kay explained to him that Vili's mother was struggling to raise her children alone. But Steve countered that their own family was also struggling. They had bills that barely got paid, and four children of their own to raise, he told her. But Mary Kay continued to have Vili over. She even talked Steve into letting the boy come along with their family on a planned vacation to Alaska. It is unknown just when the teacher-student relationship turned physical. By most accounts, Mary Kay began having sex with her student, Vili Falau, in the summer of 1996. She was 34, and he was 12, just one year younger than her oldest child. Mary Kay Letourneau was caught half-dressed in a car alone with her sixth-grade student in the summer of 1996. She was let go without any charges being filed and went right back to her normal life. In the fall, Vili started seventh grade at the middle school while Mary Kay continued teaching at Shoreline Elementary. But she continued to meet Vili in secret. She also harbored one other secret. In August, she had become pregnant and it was not her husband's baby. Steve and Mary Kay had grown distant over the last years, so she knew that she was carrying Vili's baby. She tried to buy some time by having sex with her husband so that he'd think that the child was his, but she knew it was just a matter of time before he found out. The child was sure to be born with Vili's complexion and dark eyes and hair. Both she and her husband were fair and blonde, so it would be a dead giveaway. But for the time being, Mary Kay decided not to think about that. In October, Mary Kay confided to a friend about Vili. Without revealing who he was or his age, she admitted she was seeing someone else and had fallen in love. She said he was her soulmate and, quote, the person she'd been looking for all of her life, unquote. There had already been talk in the school about Mary Kay and Vili. There had also been some close calls. The previous school year, the janitor walked in on Mary Kay and Vili in the teacher's restroom. The lights were off, and when he switched them on, it looked as if the teacher and her student were coming out of a huddle. Mrs. Letourneau told the janitor that the boy was upset, and she'd found him hiding in the restroom. Students also reported witnessing Vili and Mrs. Letourneau slow dancing inappropriately at a classroom Valentine's Day party. After Mary Kay told her husband she was pregnant, Steve confided to a cousin that he thought his wife was, quote, pregnant by that 13-year-old, unquote. However, he made him promise not to reveal what he'd told him. He didn't have to worry, because his cousin thought this was a crazy idea and didn't take it seriously. 
Then in February of 1997, Steve discovered love letters written between his wife and Vili, which confirmed his suspicions. Shocked and angered, but knowing this could get Mary Kay arrested, he couldn't immediately decide what to do. He shared the information with his cousin, and the next day, unknown to Steve, his relatives made an anonymous phone call to Child Protective Services and the Highline School District. Child Protective Services then notified the Des Moines police. Vili Folau was called out of his 7th grade classroom and questioned by police. He admitted that he was, quote, in a relationship with Mary Kay Letourneau and that they had had sex. On March 4, 1997, Mary Kay was arrested and charged with second-degree child rape. She was released on bail and ordered to have no more contact with Vili Folau. At the time of her arrest, Mary Kay was seven months pregnant. On May 23, 1997, she gave birth to a baby girl, who she named Audrey Lokalani Fulau. On August 7, Mary Kay pled guilty to two counts of child rape. She faced 89 months, or seven and a half years, in prison. She agreed to a plea deal and was sentenced in November. She was given an 80-day jail sentence, plus three years of sex offender treatment, but would not be required to register as a sex offender. Judge Linda Lau approved the plea bargain on the condition that Mary Kay have no future contact with Vili. She served her 80 days and was released on January 6, 1998. The news of the elementary school teacher who was having a sexual relationship with her student became a scandal in the Seattle area, but had not yet become a national story. That changed on February 3, 1998 less than a month after Mary Kay was released from jail. At 2.30 a.m., a Seattle police officer was patrolling the streets looking for a stolen vehicle. He came upon a car with its windows fogged up. He looked inside and saw a couple having sex. When he ordered them to exit the vehicle, they were identified as Mary Kay Letourneau and Vili Folau. Mary Kay was immediately arrested for a probation violation. Inside the car, the officer found over $6,000 in cash baby clothes, and Mary Kay's passport. They suspected that Mary Kay had planned to flee the jurisdiction with Vili. She was remanded into custody and denied bail. The following week, Mary appeared before the same judge who had approved her plea deal. Judge Lau told her, you had an opportunity that you foolishly squandered. She then sentenced Letourneau to her full sentence of seven and a half years in prison. She was sent to the Washington Correction Center for Women. And there was another development. During the one month that Mary Kay was free, she became pregnant for the second time with Vili's child. Now the media had a field day with the scandalous story. Local and national news outlets, as well as People Magazine, Hard Copy, and Entertainment Tonight, covered the case and followed every update. Steve Letourneau, Vili Folau, his mother, Shorewood Elementary School teachers, and others were all sought out for comments. In October, Mary gave birth to another daughter she named Georgia. Custody of both children was given to Vili and his mother Suna as legal guardian, since Vili was just 14 years old. Mary was still forbidden from having contact, written, verbal, or in person, with Vili. However, she continued to send him letters and arrange phone calls. Some of these attempts were discovered, and she was punished for it by being put into solitary confinement. She spent 18 of her first 24 months in solitary, once doing a six-month stretch when she refused to comply with these restrictions. Steve was granted a divorce in 1999 and was awarded full custody of their four children. Later on, when she became eligible, he allowed the children to visit their mother. The story became such a media sensation and an intrusion into their lives that Steve eventually moved with the children back to Alaska. Meanwhile, Vili, barely into his teens, struggled to care and provide for two infants. His mother had a tough time making ends meet before, and now the family had two more mouths to feed. Suna loved her granddaughters, and Vili was an attentive father, but he really had no one to turn to. He couldn't talk to his middle school friends about the challenges of buying milk and diapers for two kids. There was no one in his peer group who could relate to his life, His childhood had ended, and he was left to deal with the fallout. Vili became depressed, 
and dropped out of school in his early teens. He vowed to be there for his daughters, as his own father had vanished from his life early on. His mother helped as much as she could, but she had to work to provide for all of the children, so Vili often struggled alone. As his friends and siblings did their homework and attended football games, parties, and prom, he looked for work and cared for two children. He would admit that there were many times he felt suicidal and even planned to end his own life more than once. I was in a very dark place in my teens, Vili later told a reporter. In 2002, Suna Fulau filed a lawsuit against the Highline School District and the Des Moines Police Department for negligence. The school district, she claimed in her suit, had received several reports of inappropriate behavior by Mary Kay Letourneau towards her son, and they had not responded. She also named the police department in her lawsuit. She was not informed about the officer's suspicions when Mary Kay was first brought in after being caught with Billy. They had not done enough to investigate the suspected crime, the suit alleged. As a result, the sexual abuse had continued. During a nine-week trial, a police department representative testified that the claim had no merit, saying that the officers and detectives involved in the case did everything they could to thoroughly investigate. The city attorney placed the blame on Vili's mother, Suna. In her arguments, she stated that Vili's mother had admitted to abusing her son by punishing him physically. How this was relevant to a sexual abuse case, I'm not sure. She also said that Suna had only filed a lawsuit to try and collect money. The plaintiff was asking for $1 million in damages. The attorney pointed out that Suna had been paid tens of thousands of dollars by media outlets for interviews, but was now broke. She claimed that this was Suna's only motivation for filing the lawsuit. The lawyer portrayed Suna as someone who had profited from Mary Kay's crime, without stressing the fact that she had already been struggling to provide for her own family and now had two more children to care for, the children of her teenage son and Mary Kay. There were dozens of witnesses for the plaintiff's side that came forward to testify about suspicious activity they had witnessed at the school, including the before-mentioned meeting in the teacher's bathroom and another incident where Mary Kay allowed Vili to drive her car. In contrast, the defense only put two witnesses on the stand who testified for less than a day. In the end, the jury rejected Fulau's claim, and the case was dismissed. When asked what had swayed their decision, most jury members declined to comment. Only one or two people in the jury spoke with reporters. They simply replied that they'd considered all the evidence and decided that the lawsuit had no merit. At this point in the story, I have to describe what the media coverage was like in this case. One thing that struck me as particularly disturbing was the language and the terms used while the story was being covered in the news at that time. Mary Kay and Vili were often described as having a relationship or an affair or a tryst. Letourneau's feelings for her 12-year-old student were described as an infatuation. She was often portrayed as love-struck, and it was said that she, quote, couldn't stay away from Vili because she believed herself to be in love with him. Vili was incorrectly described as appearing more mature than his chronological age and looking more like a man than a boy. The photos I've seen of a 12- and 13-year-old Vili Falau show a very thin boy with little or no muscle structure and a smooth prepubescent face, far from the mustachioed muscular man the press portrayed him to be. Vili's race was even brought into the conversation, with some alluding, or even straight out saying, that Polynesian boys mature faster than children from other cultures, and it was normal for them to begin having sex at an earlier age. Others made the argument that the sexual relationship between Falau and his teacher was consensual. This is often the attitude some have when an older woman is discovered to be having sex with a teenage boy. It's frequently dismissed with a wink and a nod, or the joke that the boy, quote, really got lucky, unquote. But a woman having sex with an underage boy is still a crime. The law becomes a bit fuzzier, and reporting laws even vary, when the age of the parties is within a certain parameter like a 19-year-old having a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old. Then the determination whether to charge the legal adult with a crime is weighed on a case-by-case basis. But generally, an adult having sex with a child under the age of 15 is always a crime, whether the adult is male or female, or if they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or beyond. Why Mary Kay Letourneau was portrayed as a lovesick girl who couldn't stay away from her underage soulmate 
completely baffles me. To begin with, Vili Fulau was in elementary school and was only 12 years old when she began having sex with him. Secondly, she was a 34-year-old mother of four who'd been married for 12 years, not an immature 20-year-old. She was also an adult in a position of authority. All of these facts placed Letourneau in a category that I did not see one person report at that time, that of a predatory pedophile. If we switch the genders, if Letourneau was a 34-year-old man preying on a 12-year-old girl, no one would have a problem calling him a sexual predator and a pedophile that needed to be locked up. The girl would rightfully be identified as a crime victim who needed to be protected from her abuser. But because Vili was male, he wasn't seen in the same way. But make no mistake, Vili was groomed and manipulated by his teacher, probably beginning from the time he was in the second grade. Whether she knew that that was what she was doing or not, Mary Kay Letourneau's behavior towards Vili was typical of a sexual predator. She singled him out, made him feel special, and then professed to love him. She also picked him out of the other boys in her class, most likely because he was the most vulnerable to this kind of attention. He was new in the school, of a different race than most of his classmates, and came from a broken home where parental attention was in short supply. Mary Kay and Vili did not have a love affair. They had a relationship in which an adult manipulated a child for sex. Some would argue that what happened after Mary Kay was released from prison made everything okay. But I've uncovered details that make a case for Vili continuing to be a victim of Mary Kay Letourneau, even as an adult. I'll share these details with you, and you can decide for yourself. In August of 2004, Mary Kay Letourneau completed her seven-and-a-half-year sentence for child rape and was released from prison. She was required to register as a Level 2 sex offender. The contact order between Vili and Mary Kay was still in effect. Vili was now 21 years old. His daughters were seven and six. In interviews Mary Kay granted years later, she says that her daughters visited her while she was in prison. She describes conversations she and Vili had before her release. This confirms my suspicion that Mary Kay never stopped communicating with her victim as she was ordered. Instead, she was in almost constant communication with him and was still manipulating his life from inside prison. She could not have coordinated visits with her two youngest children unless they were in contact. While Mary was not allowed to see Vili while she was in prison, she was able to visit with her children. He or his mother would have had to transport them there, which means that they were in communication with Mary. It's very possible that Mary's contact with Vili was being aided by one of his friends or siblings or his mother. In this way, Mary was still making her needs known to him, and because she had directed the relationship from the beginning, Vili continued to bend to her will. One thing I'm very sure she was urging him to do was to file to have the no-contact order lifted once she was released from prison. This he did, going before Judge Linda Lau just three days after Mary's release to make the request. Billy told the judge it was necessary so that he and Mary Kay could co-parent their daughters. The judge granted this, and the no-contact order between Mary Kay and Billy was lifted. In an interview years later, Billy made it clear that he made the request so that Mary Kay could have a relationship with their children. But Mary Kay didn't stop there. Now, with nothing standing in her way, she manipulated herself back into Billy's life. The media went into overdrive once again, when it was announced that Mary Kay and Vili were engaged to be married. Now the relationship was portrayed as a great love story. These two, it was said, had remained in love all these years, just waiting for Mary Kay to be released so that they could run to the altar and be free to love one another. If this were true, the wedding would have happened days or weeks after her release. Instead, it was six months before a wedding date was set and another three months before vows were exchanged. The wedding took place on May 20, 2005. Billy was now 22 years old. Mary was 43. Their seven- and eight-year-old daughters served as flower girls. Two of Mary Kay's children from her first marriage also attended. The couple gave exclusive access to wedding photos and video to the television show Entertainment Tonight. Soon after the wedding, Mary Kay told reporters that they were hoping to have another baby. They never did have any other children.
After the hoopla of the wedding died down, the media once again left the suburbs of Seattle and the newly formed Fulao family lived their life largely under the radar. Mary Kay, unable to ever work as a teacher again due to her felony conviction, took a job as a legal clerk. Vili found work alternately as a construction worker and a hardware store employee. He was never able to fulfill his dream of an art career. But one of Vili's hobbies was mixing music, and he started working as a DJ for local clubs on the weekends. One enterprising club owner, Mike Morris, thought there was an opportunity to showcase the once-media-famous Vili Folau as a draw to his nightclub, Fuel. In 2009, Mary Kay worked with the club to promote a Hot for Teacher night. Vili was billed as DJ Headline, and there was a $5 cover charge to get in. The promotional night ran a few times, mostly to small crowds of less than 200 people. Most came to get a glimpse of the now 47-year-old ex-felon and her 26-year-old husband, who'd once dominated the headlines with their scandalous relationship. Mary Kay showed up dressed to impress, in a short strapless black dress and silver sandals. She signed souvenir posters of the event with a picture of the two of them on the cover. The autographed posters cost $7 a pop. For $20, bucks, club goers could purchase an autographed t-shirt, also with a picture of Mary Kay and Billy posing cheek to cheek. A reporter with KOMO4 News asked the club owner if creating a promotion that revolved around a convicted child rapist wasn't in bad taste. Morris answered, It wouldn't be funny if it was a situation that was happening right now. But it's a situation that happened a long time ago. She served her time. Now they're married. They had kids together. And we're just having fun. I got a few more details about these Hot for Teacher nights from an inside source who shall remain nameless. I want to thank them for alerting me to this strange promotional event in the first place, or I would have never heard about it. This person lives in the area where the club is located and had heard that Vili Fulao was DJing there. Some of their friends decided to check it out, just out of curiosity. It was pretty much as I described. Not that well attended. Most of the attendees were family members and regulars. It was pretty low-key, etc. Except on one night, the party took an ugly turn when Mary Kay began to get upset that girls were hanging around the DJ booth too long. Mary Kay appeared to be a person who liked to be in control. She flouted the rules in prison and even her own parole requirements when they didn't suit her. She had also been in control of the relationship with Billy, which was easy to do when she was the adult and Billy was a child. But now that they were both adults, Mary Kay had to be feeling a loss of control over Billy, and this caused her to behave oddly, and even at times, out of control. So the situation at the club, with Mary Kay feeling possessive and threatened by other women, and, I'd imagine, with alcohol added to the mix, things spun out of control. An intoxicated Mary Kay, according to my sources, made a scene, and then began arguing loudly with Vili. I would imagine that that put a bit of a damper on the festivities. The club gig kind of fizzled out after that. In 2015, Mary Kay and Vili Folau were back in the news as they were celebrating their 10th wedding anniversary. Barbara Walters sat down with the couple for a so-called tell-all interview. Barbara asked Mary Kay if she had regrets about stealing Billy's childhood. She responded that she didn't believe she did steal his childhood. She said Billy had time to date and sow his wild oats while she was locked up in prison. She said he, quote, hadn't been faithful while she was away. This is another telling detail about Mary Kay's mindset. Remaining faithful or not implied that she considered them to be in an intimate relationship. Although she would say that he was free to date, when he did, she considered it cheating. This also confirms that she was still in contact with him, although it was forbidden. The question is, shouldn't this have been another charge against her that could have added time to her sentence? The couple continued to struggle financially and had a few minor scrapes with the law for moving violations over the years. Billy was charged with a DUI when he had an accident and his blood alcohol level was recorded at .08, just barely over the legal limit. Mary Kay was caught driving with a suspended license and in a car with expired tags. Billy's wages were garnished in 2016 for a small unpaid debt. In May of 2017, Billy filed for legal separation from Mary Kay. Radar Online would report that in an interview, he explained that he'd only filed because he was seeking a license to legally sell cannabis products. 
a background check was required for the licensee as well as their spouse. Because Mary Kay was a convicted felon, it would potentially prevent him from being eligible. But when asked about this later on, Vili would say that he had never given an interview to Radar Online and that the account was false. Vili admitted during another interview that after Mary Kay was sent to prison, he'd come to the conclusion that he no longer loved her. He said he thought he loved her when he was a kid, but he wasn't sure that he had. He'd married her, he said, because he didn't want his daughters to grow up with their parents living apart like he had. So it's telling that it was Vili that filed for the divorce, and that he did it in 2017, the year that his youngest daughter turned 19 years old and left home. He would later admit that he'd stayed with Mary Kay mostly for the children. He loved her, but he wasn't in love with her, he said. He loved his children and wanted what he thought was best for them. Mary Kay continued to try and make the relationship work. Even though legally separated, the couple remained living together. Mary Kay said they didn't have enough money to rent separate places to live. I wonder if this was true, or if she was still trying to keep Vili tied to her. She was unemployed at the time, though. In November of the following year, it was reported that the couple had reconciled. According to a friend of Mary Kay's, it was her who was trying to keep the marriage together, while Vili had been ready to move on for some time. Just a few months later, in February of 2019, Vili filed final divorce papers with the court. But they weren't apart for very long. Sometime in 2019, Mary Kay Letourneau was diagnosed with cancer. By July of the next year, she was in her final days. Vili remained by her side as she passed away on July 6, 2020. I don't think there's been a case I've covered in some time that has made me as frustrated and even angry as this case did. The way the story was portrayed in the media was nothing short of irresponsible and I believe served to continue to victimize Billy Folau. I believe that Mary Kay Letourneau was not an evil woman, but a very sick one. Her behavior, however, was selfish, extremely harmful, and caused long-range consequences for everyone connected to her. What made her sick, I believe, was a combination of things. Her early trauma of losing her brother and feeling responsible for his tragic death, and her father's secret life that was so hypocritical to the morals and principles he insisted his children abide by, surely contributed to it. Her need for male attention, combined with her narcissistic belief that her love for Vili was special, caused her to behave as if she was not bound by the same laws as everyone else. Perhaps even the fact that her behavior was considered so scandalous that the media reported on it reinforced her belief that her feelings for Vili were special and something no one else could really understand, which, by the way, is something that many pedophiles believe in their distorted thinking. She became a minor celebrity, which further validated her continued relationship with Vili as something of great value that she wanted to continue, no matter what the cost. And what was the cost? a boy whose childhood ended when his teacher took advantage of his innocent attentions towards her as an invitation to initiate sexual advances, a child whose opportunities were taken away when he became the father of her two children by the age of 14, six children who were deprived of a mother because of the decisions Letourneau made to commit a crime in order to get her needs met at the expense of her family. As for the type of life her children experienced as a result of her decisions, her two daughters with Billy were asked if they knew how their parents met. They said they did, and the interviewer then asked how they felt about it. They responded, quote, It's just normal for us. We don't think about it much. It's just our life, unquote. The fact that their experience of family life is, one, living without their mother for the first seven years of their lives, and two, that their very conception is viewed in the eyes of the law as a criminal act, is very tragic and sad and a part of their life story that they can never escape. Some of the most disturbing portions of the interviews that Mary Kay and Vili Folau gave in 2015 and 2018 are when Mary Kay places full responsibility on Vili for the events that took place back when he was just a child. She says, quote, I was pursued by Vili. He was the aggressor, unquote. In one point in their 2018 interview, 
she insists that it was Villy's idea to begin a sexual relationship. As she says this, I watched Villy's body language closely. He tenses up and then looks at her somewhat skeptically. He doesn't say a word, but his expression gives you the sense that he doesn't agree with her statement. In fact, during the entire interview, he says very little. Mary Kay answers most of the questions, even some that are directed at Villy. He seems very reluctant to disagree with her out loud. But in this exchange, she notices his reaction. At that point, she turns to him and asks, Who was the boss? Referring to who initiated the first sexual encounters. Villy doesn't answer, but appears to be uncomfortable with the question. Mary Kay continues to insist he answer, asking him over and over, Who was the boss? Who was the boss? He finally gives her the answer she was looking for after being badgered repeatedly. She then looks at the interviewer with a grin, as if vindicated. It's a very disturbing scene. I've included a link to this interview in the show notes. Mary Kay says it was also Villy who first professed to be in love. But remember, we're talking about a 12-year-old boy. I'd imagine a lot of prepubescent boys develop crushes on their teachers. But most teachers find a way to express to the child that the relationship that they share is one of a teacher and a student just as it is for all the other children they teach. Most teachers, fortunately, don't encourage and nurture the child's feelings and then sexualize their interactions with them. Mary Kay says that when he told her about his feelings for her, she answered, can you hold that feeling for a long, long time? This indicates that she continued to encourage him in this unrealistic fantasy that could be nothing but harmful to him. One of the most disturbing quotes from the interview comes when Mary Kay says she didn't know that having a relationship with her student would be considered a crime. She then says, we are in love. How can it be a crime? She also dismisses the idea that it's a criminal act by saying that 13-year-olds are pursuing sex and having sex and that they are, quote, not children, unquote. Again, this type of distorted belief about children as fully autonomous sexual beings is also common to pedophiles. Well. Let's make it clear. An adult having sex with a child is a crime. A child cannot consent to having sex because the power is always in the hands of the adult. An adult is perceived as a figure of authority in the eyes of a child, whether it be a parent or other relative, a teacher or a coach. It is incumbent on the adult not to use this power to manipulate a child for their own selfish needs. Billy was not the boss. He was not the aggressor when he was 12 or 13 or 14 years old. Even if he did pursue her, as she put it, it was her responsibility as the adult to stop it from progressing. She did not, but instead encouraged it. The blame and the responsibility lies 100% with Mary Kay Letourneau alone. I really hope that someone has explained that to Vili Folau, and he now knows it in his heart to be the truth. Finally, I'll leave you with a quote from an article in the Seattle Post-Intelligencer made by Deanne Yamamoto, Director of Client Services for the King County Sexual Assault Resource Center. Quote, Most people believe that Letourneau is unusual as sex offenders go. In truth, she is a textbook case, Yamamoto said. She used her position of trust and power to charm a child and, over time, provided him with what he wanted most, attention and affection. She groomed him and his family for years and used his trust to gain sexual gratification. So the fact that people see this as a love story is outrageous and appalling. That will do it for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'll be back next week with another chapter in the series, Bad Teacher. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. There's one detail I didn't address in this episode connected to this case. That is, what happened to Mary Kay Letourneau's two half-siblings that her father had with his mistress? Well, that's a very odd detail that I didn't know how to fit into this episode, so I will share it on Patreon. If you're not a Patreon member, you can get all the details and sign up at patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative and research assistant is Lorena Garcia, and original music for the show was composed by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Until next time, be good to one another.